the savage from Warren Point just back from his travels in North Eng uh, New England yeah. in the United States of America. And uh, we're just talking the joys generally of the way we eat. And I was saying uh, breakfast can be something as simple as blueberries, pineapple slice, and some uh, pumpkin seed oil. You would, you would eat frugally as well, wouldn't you? Bread would be a temptation for you, I suppose. Bread, bread, uh, bread would be my downfall. Mm. If I ever want to lose a lot of weight, I would, I would cut out the bread. But I don't take breakfast. Yeah. Not generally. If I was yeah. away somewhere on holidays, mm. then obviously the temptations of the, mm. of the, the, mm. bu the buffet yeah. breakfast is too hard to resist. But generally, I wouldn't take breakfast. Something I haven't done. It's probably the wrong way to go about it. They reckon that you should breakfast like... It's breakfast like a king and lunch like a prince and have supper like a but pauper, you see, isn't it? Those who say these things... Yes are obese fellows themselves. <laughs> yeah. But the reality is, you know, you don't take breakfast. I take, what I've told you, a yeah. slice of fresh pineapple, yeah. uh, 250 milligrams of blueberries, yeah. and the pumpkin seed oil, and that's all I physically eat until seven o'clock in the evening. Yes. Nothing else. Yeah. And then I would have a dinner that's not, no bigger than the size of my fist. Mm -hmm. So if I should dive uh, uh, urgently and quickly and unexpectedly, it'll be a grave injustice. <laughs> I will yeah. die saying, no, I shouldn't be going yet yeah. because, because. I've been healthy and looked after myself. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Now you had a good holiday. You were away in North England, uh, no, in, in, uh, in New England in North America. Exactly. We were there for two weeks. We did five of the six uh, New England states. What drew you and your dear wife, Frances, to the New England states. Well, you've actually hit the nail on the head there. It was my dear wife, Frances. <laughs> <laughs> because Boston, while it'd be something that might have some sort of mild appeal for me, it wasn't something that was actually calling me. Yeah. But it was basically the leaves changing colour in the New England states. And it's something, that they talk about New England in the fall, you know, and that, it was basically that. You, know. you saw it? Oh, I did. It, it, it's tremendous. See, you know, we ha photographs don't do it justice because we have the same here. If you go down the dual carriageway into Warren Point there, you see the leaves change in colour. You will. And you, you take, will. and you take a photograph of it and you've got that, which is exactly the same as any photograph you'll take mm. in New England. Mm. But mm. the vastness of it, the amount well, of it in New England, wow. just, you know, yeah. Sway them with just them. acres and acres, miles upon miles of the changing of, colours. Of changing colours, wow. you know. The, Bo the Boston, it was your first time in Boston. Surely, yeah. Uh, it hadn't attracted you. Yep. In a sentence, describe the wonderment of Boston to me. Hard to do in a sentence, but it's got, it's got culture. It has history because of the start of the American War of Independence. And it's was that the Tea Party? The Tea Party came much earlier, I think. I'm not sure. I'm not great on the American no. history, but the Tea Party came earlier. But the... Paul Revere of Longfellow got, on the, got yes. on the horse and yes. rode. Uh, exactly. Bringing and word. He got, he got word that there was going to be uh, a march of, of the British Army into, into Concord to try and find the guns and arms and munitions that were supposedly hidden in Concord. So he got on his horse along with two others to, to warn them. And he got to Lexington. We went to Lexington where the first the shot that was, fired, was supposedly fired that was heard around the world Right, um, that started the American War of Independence, and they went on to Concord. But basically, yes, that that, that history is was all there. Is, it was there. Mm. We, I got a photograph taken outside Paul Revere's house, you know, and it's wooden slatted, the old wooden ah, slatted yeah. type. Of. Now, yeah. well, it's the original house. It could be a bit like Trigger's Broom. Do you remember ah. Trig Trigger's Broom? Yeah, yeah, I mean, in Only Fools and Horses, it yes, could be that sort yes. of thing. You know, everything could have been changed bit by to, bit to suit the story as the years go yeah. on. You know, yeah. but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Now, the uh, uh, Nauticalia, it was a place of the ocean too. Yes, but we didn't, places like Cape Cod and that, we didn't go to those. Mm. You know, we, we spent four days in Boston and then drove the rest. We, we did a cover to a thousand miles in the two mm. weeks mm. around the rest of the New England states. Um, certainly, um, the, the sea figures you know, a lot in, in New England. It's, mm. it, it's obviously all on the Atlantic coast. So yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, gorgeous altogether. The food. Yeah, f food's a tricky one because because Francis is a vegetarian, sometimes it's difficult to find a restaurant that caters for us both. I, I eat pretty much anything, but um, usually the, 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 the safe option is an Italian mm -hmm. where she can get something that's vegetarian in there. She can get a vegetarian lasagna or a vegetarian this or mm -hmm. vegetarian that, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I can have whatever I, I, I like mm -hmm. really. You know. You were vegetarian once yourself. I was about, 20, about 30 years ago, in the, in the mid, mid, early to mid-80s. 
I was a vegetarian, but at that stage, I was vegetarian there basically because, not because I had any great um, sort of uh, sympathy or empathy with, with with the animal situation at that stage, although I would have that now, mm. but more mainly because I was training and it was something I thought was, was good for, for fitness mm. and good for health. I, I didn't find it so. I didn't find any difference. Mm. When I stopped mm. being a vegetarian, I didn't find any great difference to my health. Talking about your fitness and talking about your penchant for doing exercise and judo in particular, <laughs> Uh, are you, a, are you an, an aficionado of the belief that we are what we eat? Certainly it contributes. Mm -hmm. It's got to. Mm -hmm. you know, um, I think in extremes. Mm -hmm. I think if you're a moderate eater, it, you can eat almost anything in moderation mm -hmm. and it won't make a big difference. Mm -hmm. even, you know? But I think if you overdo you know, the sweet stuff, the fats, mm -hmm. the fizzy drinks, and certainly that will have an impact on you. You would have seen lots of the fizzy drinks when you were a teacher because they were, were infamous for the kind of rubbish food our children at schools eat. Mm -hmm. Was that your experience at Mark's when you saw youngsters coming to school, they were eating the wrong things, they're maybe they weren't just getting the right advice along the line or what? I think probably, yes certainly, you would see kids come up the road in the morning eating bags of crisps and drinking things. But they, I think that's possibly down to the fact that that was our breakfast. Yeah, I can understand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I saw, I remember sitting at the station in, in Dublin and uh, three very large young women came in. And now these were, these were obese ladies. Mm -hmm. Young. Yes. They'd have been under 22, 23. But goodness gracious, in the time, the half hour waiting for the train, they had sort of squelchy stuff that they sucked out of, uh, like, uh, juice. Yeah. And they had that, and then they opened up uh, tubes of, uh, of, of uh, crisps, and they opened up uh, buns. Mm. My God, yeah. it's just little wonder that people yep. are the way, the way they are. Now, back, did, did you sense when you came back from America that you needed a holiday? After I came back, Aye. actually, it was a fairly relaxing holiday. It was okay. It was very relaxing. What about driving? In well, there? I don't drive. Francis drives, yep. and, and she was okay with it. She actually prefers to drive on the other side of the road. Yeah, yeah. there. I'm not going to say about here. But ah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But I think she does. Yeah, she prefers. She she doesn't mind driving. Yeah. So yeah. you're back again, and uh, have you engaged in any training since? I started. Um, we had a Pilates class last Thursday. And then mm. I had a judo on Sunday. Are and you doing Pilates as a, you're bringing Pilates to people? No, no, I. No, I you do, are a I, pupil. I, I, I go to in Pilates. Yeah, it's Kira Foster in, yeah. in uh, Mary Street, in Mary Street there. Does, so tell me about yeah. Pilates. What, what for you is the benefit of how long have you been doing Pilates? Pilates. Fra Francis did it first, and then she talked me into going. For for me personally, I I can do strength training through weight through the gym. I go to the gym and I do that. Mm. But Pilates is great for stretching for me and for reaching. They, they talk about the core. Mm. I don't understand the terminology of this, mm. and probably, mm. but they talk about the core core fitness and core training and you know, training a part of your body that other fitness like other regimes don't mm. do mm. and are very important. You know, like say for your posture. They, they reckon a lot of problems probably down to the fact that you don't stand properly. Yes. You know, you don't engage your core whenever you're doing these things. And uh, you know, the, the idea of Pilates is to bring that on. Mm. Yeah. And it, it, then the judo comes because y your lifetime so far, of dedication to it. Are there things you still have to achieve in judo? I think there has to be. You're always learning. What are oh. your aspirations? What are your dreams? Ambitions, <sighs> just to know more, to learn more. That's that. that nothing more than that. I do. And that's, you know, a, that's a general comment uh, uh, about uh, life. Uh, yeah, I like and it. you you focus then in on the judo. Yeah, well, I I think the thing is that whenever you're younger, you have specific ambitions. Like, say, for example, you want to be a, a world champion, you want to be a British champion, you want to be a European champion, you want to mm -hmm. get your black belt, you want mm -hmm. to get your next black belt, mm -hmm. and so on. But I think. As you get older, those things become less important to you. Mm -hmm. And I had a young lad the other day who came back to judo, and he, the first thing he said to me basically was, um, "Do you think I can still be an Olympic Olympic champion?" Wow! Right. I said, "Fair enough. That's a great ambition." But you know, first thing you want to do is want to do judo yeah. for its own sake. Yeah. And that's why I do judo for its own sake. Now I don't mm -hmm. do it for any specific mm -hmm. purpose other than that. And a lot in that sort of sense. All my ambition is just to know more, yeah. to learn more about you, to understand it better. It's a, it, in so many ways, it's a classical pursuit. Because if you go back to something like 
the wrestling of ancient Greece, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, you know, it's not a million miles divorced from the tanglements that you get into in judo. Yeah, but the philosophy behind it would be different. Yes, yeah. You know, I think you know, wrestling, you know, Greek, uh, Greek Roman wrestling and that type of thing was purely for com com combative purposes. It mm. was to go on and beat somebody. There wasn't, mm. as far as I know, you know, maybe somebody will tell me different, but as far as I know, there's no great philosophical um, ethos behind it in judo. The, judo is built, is built on that. Yeah. You know. Isn't it interesting that those who created the philosophy, which is a very spiritual philosophy of mm. judo, yeah. were one and the same people who went on to do, and goodness gracious, we can all do dreadful things in war, as we know, yeah. but who particularly went on to do dreadful things in war. The, the philosophers, the spiritual people of Japan, there was an element of unkindness, mm. an element of cruelty there. I think I read an interesting article on this recently, and Basically, it was saying that the young people who joined, originally the samurai came from very rich, regal, regal families. They, they were very important people. And they had this code of Bushido, which was the code of, of honor, of um, chivalry, and that type of thing. Uh, the people who were recruited into the Japanese army prior to and during the Second World War weren't of that class. They were basic, basically people taken from the street. And they were you know, uh, indoctrinated with a different form of Bushido. They believe, what they believe what they were doing was actual Bushido, but it was a, a perverted form of Bushido, if you like, which I think um, sort of edged them towards that kind of cruelty. But it was even cruelty to themselves, the concept of the kamikaze pilot, the young men of 19 and 20, yeah. who went out wearing the white scarf, knowing mm -hmm. they would never come back. Yeah. Well, that was the last, I think that was the last, you know, ditch effort to try and retrieve something from the war, but it indicates the mindset of the Japanese that their life itself, in, its, in itself, wasn't important. Mm. It was what they did with it. Mm. And you, you were talking, we were talking earlier about the trees changing colour. In Japan, you know, the trees changing colour are very important, but probably a more important time of the year is spring, where you've got the cherry blossom. And the kamikaze pilots were called the Cherry Blossom Squadron. My goodness. For the very simple reason that whenever ch Cherry Blossom reaches its peak and is its most beautiful and then it falls off, the it's, gone. Takes, it's gone. And you know, the, the Japanese kamikaze were young men who reached their peak, were at their, you know, their, their peak of their, their fitness and you know, vitality, and then they were gone. And the Japanese, they have. They, they get, they get very sad at this time, you know, at that time of the year. They'll sit and watch the cherry blossom fall and they'll cry under the cherry blossom mm -hmm. trees. It's a, th it's a thing we call hanami. Hanami. Hanami, fla flower viewing or plant viewing, where they sit and have picnics underneath the cherry blossom and they watch it fall. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's, that, that's a, an empathy with, a sympathy with nature, the loss of nature, yes. as opposed to roll back into the war and the kamikaze. It's yes. not that. No. Uh, and it's, a, you know, it's... it's, it's a, did they ever forgive for the Enola Gay, and Hiroshima, Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Nagasaki. Um, Is there, you've been there, you've talked with them, you know them. Yeah, I Has think there been forgiveness? They don't talk about it. They just don't talk they about don't it. They don't talk about it. Not, not, you know, I have never ever spoken to a Japanese person about, uh, mm. about the Second World War generally, or certainly not mm. about uh, Hiroshima or Nagasaki. But, from watching, I watch NHK, which is the Japanese program or Japanese channel on satellite, and you do get discussions from time to time on this. And the general, yes, they do, right? I think maybe the problem is, is maybe there's no forgiveness the other way. There's a lot of people still do not forgive the Japanese for what oh, they yeah, did. Absolutely. You know? But our life of strength through judo hmm. embraces forgiveness because there is no shame in forgiving. No. Certainly not. It's a strength. I think, and this idea of, you know, by helping others, you help yourself. You know, you don't really help anybody else unless you can forgive them to start off with. Got it. Go well. <laughs> Take care. Thank you very much, sir.